now. So I'm recording right now. Thank you for reminding me of that. Y'all, what I'll do is I'm gonna um, put this on YouTube when we're all done. So other, you know, other people can look at it later. And I don't know if you all got the list of all the recordings that um, we have that I put into that Google Doc. I don't know if people saw that. <clears throat> Okay, great. That's awesome. I see uh, you put that in the uh, chat thingy. Thanks. And I'll be right back. I'm going to get some, uh, some more coffee. Wow. I've been uh, getting emails. Um, we're trying to put together maps of all of the nearby plantations around Montpelier uh, in GIS to create kind of a master map of um, the region. And the descendant community is really interested in this to be able to link the show, show physically the links between uh, communities. So I put out a couple of queries to people and there's turns out there's all kinds of stuff that's been digitized out there and there are people are willing to share, which is great. And um, there, I invited uh, Montpelier staff to this as well, because a number of people heard about it and they were like, we want to learn about the portico and other things. So <laughs> as we do these Wednesday um, uh, uh, lunches, we'll uh, get more and more and more constituencies involved. So, <laughs> hello, hi Kathy. <laughs> Hello, oh, hey, Lindy. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Peggy. How are you? <laughs> and um, yeah, we got some of our um, our main um, uh, data entry people here, which is great. So changing all the uh, um, the digital names from nondescript names to actually useful ones that at the end of this presentation i'm going to give you all a update on the gis map um, and show you where where that all stands which is great so and i'm about to add a lot more of that uh probably tomorrow morning um there's been uh quite a few features that hannah and taylor have worked on and gotten the the photos um even even more refined which is great 
Taylor and Hannah are really doing a great job of uh, responding quickly. What's that, Dean? They're, they're, they're getting back uh, now to us pretty quickly when we have questions. Oh, that's great. That, that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You can remember what it was about and, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's what I should do. Yeah. Yeah, Hannah and Taylor are in that full time uh, with what they're oh. doing. So, and uh, Hannah, it looks like you're in Central Station. Holy cow. <laughs> I, I just realized the last people I Zoomed were my friends from high school. And this is the background from the TV show oh. iCarly. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> And I like Dennis's background. It looks like he's in the field. <laughs> yep, he, right, right out there. <laughs> Lurking Lur in the parking lot. How <laughs> do you like my background? It's very realistic, Dean. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, I go for realism. I, mine is so real. I moved a pile of clothing off the couch so I wouldn't be embarrassed. So. <laughs> There's a picture of uh, Montpelier right here. Uh, you probably can't see; it's too far away. Larry uh, took that. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to see. I can bring it over, but I'm kind of <laughs> yeah, we love all the all the photos that have been compiled are great, especially from that photo. Yeah. Room. Just some amazing things. So yeah, this Larry is gave awesome. Me that, gave me that one. Well, in case anybody needs to, if we go a little bit longer mm -hmm. and anybody needs to leave early, I am uh, uh, recording this right now. So um, it'll probably be later on tonight. I'll put it on YouTube because with these regular Zoom meetings, you can't do a live feed to YouTube or to Facebook. But I just like the feel of like everybody on the, in the Zoom meeting instead of like a webinar. So you can see, see everybody. But, um, well, thanks for, for tune, tuning in, and uh, great to see your all's faces. Hi, Prenny, good to see you. <laughs> we're, um, uh, we're getting ready um, to start these. This will be the first inaugural um, lunchtime uh, chat, you know, where we're giving, giving some, some substantive content. And over the next uh, month or so, we're going to continue these. We've got the... the um, the May and early June schedule set, and uh, in another couple of weeks, we'll send out the schedule for um, you know for for June and and the first part of uh, part of July. So, but decided um, that uh, we would give some conversation to the portico uh, because a number of you all are actually doing data entry on the portico, changing the uh, the names of. The digital photos and the um, scanned um, profiles and, and strata cards to their actual unit designations, which has been a huge help. And I was um, thinking that this lecture would give you all plenty of background on the portico as you started to get into it, but you all have been moving so fast that we're already halfway through the portico. So I think what we're going to need to do is um, probably around. Um, Mid June, I'll give a, a lecture on the lecture next next area, which is going to be the bunker. But um, in the meantime, next week we've got um, Mary is going to be uh, doing a talk on wine and, and associated artifacts. She'll she'll be doing that live from the lab. Um, and then the week after that, I believe is let's see, that is um, Chris is going to be talking about his thesis research um, on the uh, the temple and the ice house. And then after that, um, uh, uh, Terry is gonna be talking about digital paperwork and our move to the digital realm here at Montpelier. And then we'll, we'll get a new schedule set up after that. Hannah and Taylor are gonna be giving their, giving their talks that are supposed to happen at the MAC conference. So we'll be excited to hear their talk live, which would be great. But um, uh, I, I don't um, see, um, Roy on here yet, but our new uh, president, Roy Young, uh, he was going to try, he's got another meeting right now, but he wanted to come on and say hi, maybe this one or maybe the next one, uh, to, to see some of your all's faces and get to know you all. He is um, from, um, he, his, his last uh, stint was at Mount Vernon, and uh, he just started about three weeks ago, and uh, is really uh, kicking it up a notch. He's got us doing all kinds of strategic plans now, you know, looking at the next 18 months and 
throughout, it's been kind of an interesting time to get a new president because of course with COVID, we're in a whole new scheme. And so it makes it kind of a nice time for a new person to come in and be like, hey, let's mix things up because there's more than just a reason to meet me arriving here. It's the whole world is changing. So it's been an interesting process. But um, uh, so but that, that's going to be the schedule for the next month or so. And like I said, we'll keep you all up to date on the um, on the um, with the newsletter. Um, is the newsletter the best way to give you all the schedule for these? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I, we had done a, a Google um, form to have people register the last time um, and didn't know if that was cumbersome or served as a good reminder because then we'd know who was uh, planning on attending. Because um, uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to put the Zoom links on Facebook because then you can have Zoom bombers that happen. So that's why, you know, keep it in contained to the newsletter is how we're doing it. But if anybody has any suggestions on that, you could um, put that into the, uh, into the, uh, into the chat. And it looks like it, most, a lot of people are saying yes. So, well, cool. Well, why don't, um, well, I'll go ahead and get started on uh, my discussion. Again, these discussions are intended to be very casual. So if you have questions, shout them out. Don't feel like this is going to be a monologue. Um, and it, I'll, I'll try to pay attention to the, uh, to the chat, but in case I miss it, just go ahead and uh, call me out on that. So what I'll do now is I am going to share screens with you all. And um, uh, we will, should be seeing this presentation right now. Let's see. Um, Display settings, swap presenter. Yeah, can you all see that? Is that full screen now? More or less. It's a, more or less. Okay. Yeah, I mean the the the, the picture of the uh, portico is up in uh, for mine is up in the upper left hand corner. Okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. But it's uh. Yeah, I'm, there'll be more pictures coming in, so yeah. I'm gonna pull the screen. So right. yeah. So what I um, wanted to talk with you all about today is the excavations we did at the portico. And it was, we did these excavations from starting in 2003 all the way through 2007 with the completion of the restoration of the main house. And what I just love about the portico is in many ways that it, it's like a synopsis of the history of Montpelier. And what was great about the portico is just really the scale of, of excavations, you know, around the main house. Being, being, a, um, uh, being that it was a covered site, it was really nice because we could excavate under the portico during the wintertime. What was kind of a, a bummer about it, though, was initially when we were doing the excavations, we had the, the deck. You can see, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow on the upper left hand right side right here. Um, initially when we started, we were working under the deck. So if you look at this next slide right here, you can kind of see this person stooped over. We had about a year of people being hunched under the portico. It was a space that was about, um, uh, about five foot six in, in height. And uh, it, once we finished the main excavations, that's when they decided to take the portico floor up that dated from the, um, the mid late, the late 19th century. And then we had all this room under the portico. And then by that time, we only had a few features to excavate. But what it resulted in is we were able to, we were able to climb the scaffolding and get some great pictures of our overall excavations. But what I wanted to do today was to first go through the, um, the sequence of, of the excavations that we did, kind of the history of the excavations. I thought that would give you all a, a good sense of, of uh, um, what the, um, uh, what our purpose was behind the excavations of the portico, and then get into what it told us about the history of Montpelier and what the restoration, what the excavations of the portico, how those informed the restoration of the, of not just the portico, but in fact, the whole front yard. It was pretty key. What we found under the portico is pretty key to understanding the larger landscape around uh, Montpelier. Now, all the excavations at the portico, these were part of the restoration of the main house at Montpelier. So this picture here, this is what Montpelier looked like from about 1912 up until about 2003 when we started 
to do the um, the investigations at the, at the house and do the actual restoration of the main house. And you can see, you probably, I'm sure you all have seen this picture before of the DuPont house with the red Madison house inside it. And so over, you know, a period of, it was only, you know, starting in March of 2004, in about three months, we successfully took off the wings, the DuPont wings to the house. And then it was another, um, about a, uh, a year and a half to two years until we had the envelope of the house really restored to the point where the scaffolding could come down and the house appeared you know, on the landscape much as it was. And uh, during this process, you, know, you can see in these shots right here, for example, during, uh, this is uh, the October of 2005 when, the, when all the um, scaffolding was up. We had finished the excavations underneath the portico and we had backfilled this area and then they rendered the columns and it was after that that we went under and finished the excavations of some of those features. And kind of going back in time, back here to April 2004, you can see while this demolition was happening on the main house, we all these tarps are in front of the columns here because we were actually doing excavations under the portico. So there was a whole team of archaeologists hidden behind those tarps stooped over and digging below the deck of the portico and uh during the restoration you know when when the that those two months when we had you know it's, sometimes we had heavy equipment out removing walls there were some pretty big thumps and shutters from walls falling that would you know get us all to run out and see what was going on but um with the finishing the 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 restoration of the house and excavations of the portico not only did we get a course you know a restored house but um, for a, there were a period of about three or four years where UVA compiled all this data into 3D imagery of Montpelier. And these are the models that, of course, we're using for the IMLS project to, to put all the data that you, that a number of you all are uh, doing the, the, um, the renaming project and also Hannah and Taylor with the digitization of all the, all the unit, unit plan views and profiles and strat cards. We're actually putting the archaeological data into this digital model. And uh, right now, um, Angie Payne, who is with the University of, uh, of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technology, she's putting all this into GIS. And of course, as Terry will be talking about later on this month, we're putting all of our data into GIS. But what's unique about this project is we're putting it into a 3D environment. So you'll actually be able to you know, see our excavations in relationship to this 3D built environment, which would be really cool. So, but getting down to the details on the portico excavations, we, um, with the, the beginning, beginnings of the restoration, the thoughts were that under the portico, um, we didn't know what the space under, how the, under the space of the, of the portico was used during the Madison period. All through the late 19th and all through the 20th century, there was a brick pavement that was under the portico. And I don't know how many of you all ever visited Montpelier before the restoration, but this was actually, you know, an area that you could, you could walk under, visitors could walk under. And so it was, I won't say it was necessarily used a lot by visitors, but it was something that people knew and, you know, kids would run under there and it's kind of a, kind of an interesting space because there were boxwoods that were planted all along, all, all along in front and on the side of the portico. So it's kind of this hidden area. But with the use of the space, one of the first thoughts was, is that we use the space under the portico for the bathrooms. Um, and this turned out to be not a great idea for a couple of reasons. One was that the house, the, the foundations for the house are incredibly shallow. When you're in the cellar space, basically the last brick is at the clay floor of the cellar. There's no footings for the main house. And it would have meant that we would have had to underpin the entire main house because to put the bathrooms under the portico, we would have had to dig a big pit in this area. And this is why we actually started the excavations here. We started the excavations under the portico to see what was there and to understand what it would take to put the bathrooms there. So one of the first tasks we were charged with, and this is in the fall of 2003, actually even before the restoration occurred, we had made the decision on the restoration but we're still getting the final um, approvals to actually begin the actual taking apart of the main house is we started excavating under the portico. And what we did was our units 
had to start by actually you know, excavating through this brick pavement. And what's amazing about this brick pavement, what we found is, as you can see in this profile shot right here, this is all clay fill under here. I'll get into the details of what that is, but you've got this sand bed here, and this sand bed, we identified this sand as coming from the Rapidan River. Um, it might be hard to see, but over here you can see this yellow sand, which is kind of the more standard sand you get at the hardware you know, lumber yards today. This, this was actually river sand from the Rapidan, and it made us realize quite early on that you know, we were potentially dealing with, dealing with a pre-20th century pavement. And by matching the, the, um, the, the, some of the paint lines, and I'll show you this in a second on the main house to this pavement, we were able to figure out this pavement was put down in 1848. So this is right, at, you know, four years after Dolly Madison sold the property. 1848 is when the Thornton family buys Montpelier. And they're the ones that letters talk about, you know, taking down all the slave quarters, refor reformatting the landscape around the front of the house and building the deck and the portico. So this is when we really begin to realize there were some major changes that occurred in 1848. And, we, and these excavations really tied all that together. But for the excavation sequence, again, the first phase was to take these units down and to um, really expose what this surface was. So in doing these excavations, um, you know, we get these beautiful long profiles and I'll get into these in a, in a little bit about what these deposits represent. But as soon as we got the, 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 the brick paving, the sand bed and all these, these um, rubble layers you can see right here from when the columns were reconfigured in 1848 and all this clay infill out of here, what we get, uh, what we get down to under the portico down to was a layer where the masons could begin to do the restoration on the um, on the uh, on, on the the portico columns. So we we get this down to um, the subsoil layer around about. Let's see, that was um, it was November of no no it was May of two thousand and uh, um and in in four, and that's when the um the uh, the masons came in stripped the columns and then did the restoration on these on these um, on the uh, the capitals and, uh, and especially on the bases because all these bases had to be uh, reworked because they'd been trimmed down in the 1840s so once the um, once this area was once the, the um, uh, we had done this work before the masons came in we actually had to excavate around the outside of the portico so we started under the portico in uh, the spring of 2004. And then uh, by around April, we were April and May, we were excavating units around the outside of the portico, around the perimeter. And this is where we're able to see this cut in the landscape from the 1840s and when this grade surface outside associated with the driveway had been established. Now, the, the next phase of the excavations of the portico happened after the columns were completed. So the columns were rendered in the fall of, um, of around 2000 and um, no, they were rendered in the, in, the, in the summer of 2005 and then in the fall of 2005 we went back in they had taken the deck up by this time and we excavated the remainder of the features so all of these holes are actually scaffolding holes that were dug into this cut clay subsurface in the 1840s for stuccoing the house and then along here, these lines running through here, these are um, a combination of a, of a water line along here, and then a sewage line through here that date to the DuPont years, to around 1907, 1908. And um, we actually use these trenches for um, some of the utilities that we ran you know, through the main house. We basically used this disturbed area. We excavated these areas and then dug it out. But what we also found in the excavation is the builder's trenches for the 1765 house. Um, up here in the 1797 portion of the, uh, uh, under the portico, the wall is a little bit shallower than the 1765. So there wasn't, there, there was some left of this builder's trench, but there's more builder's trench along the 1765 portion of the house. So, once, once we got this done, um, what we had was basically a complete plan view 
of this history. So this plan view you can see right here, these are these pipe trenches that are along this area right here. These are the columns, these hatched areas right here are the columns. And the, um, the blue features right here, these are these, um, these uh, um, scaffolding holes that were used for, for stucco in the house. And then there are a few features out here that are, are probably from doing some work on the, uh, on the, um, on the, uh, the portico, uh, the top of the portico, the, um, the uh, plinth at the top. So, uh, so during this, what we're able to get is just, you know, the finishing of these excavations, we get just some fantastic shots of this area once it was completely uh, excavated. And, you know, because of the scaffolding and, the, and what we had with the masons being present, we're able to evaluate so much of what we found at the portico in a really detailed way uh, actually in the field. And so what, what we're able to come up with with the results of these excavations is um, uh, basically a sequence that for the portico that in many ways matches the history of the house. And so this time sequence we've got uh, drawn up in uh, this kind of section, sectional view of the house. So in 1799 is when the portico is added to the house. And kind of the thing to pay attention to is, uh, let me get the, the pen here. Um, uh, let's see, draw. This, I guess I have to pick the pen here. This um, area right here, this is the line to pay attention to right here. This is the grade as it was in 1799. We've actually returned this grade to the area around the main house with the restoration of the house. So what's, what's kind of confusing about, you know, the, the, um, the sequence of the landscape is, is we've actually gone back to this sequence with the restoration. And this is something the Masons and the, and the restoration architects were really interested in learning about. It's, you know, where, where was the grade in the Madison date? We were able to establish this through archeology. span and one of the ways we were able to establish this is um, uh, with the um, with the the um, where the grade meets the house. What you get is a strike line in the mortar, where above where everything that's above grade, you've got a finished finished mortar faces. Where when the masons were doing the work, this is on the 1797 addition to the house. The masons would take their their um, their uh, masonry trowel and actually strike the mortar and finish it smooth so that it weathered well. Below the grade, everything that was below ground, the, the mortar was never finished. It was basically, the bricks would be put on there and in, in many cases, the, the mortar would just ooze out. It's what masons call uh, mortar snot for appropriate reasons, um, that it just kind of oozed out. And so with this, where, where the mortars worked, you can actually establish where grade is. And I've got a, another shot of this that really shows this well. This is a, a shot of the whole face of the house. And the white line is where the, 18, the 1799 through 1847 grade is under the portico. And what was um, really cool that showed up when we did, stripped all the, port, all the, the um, the stucco from that face of the, of, the, of the house, this is under the portico, is that we also found the ghost for these piers from the portico. So you remember, the, these, the pockets that were right here, these were pockets that were dug into the side of the house in the 1840s to support the new porch that was added at that point. Before uh, 1840, there were piers here and with the pier, with the grade being this much higher, these piers, you know, rested maybe six or seven inches below grade, but you can actually see the ghost of these piers right here. And the reason why that is, is this port, this face of the wall dates to around 1765. A number of y'all have remembered us talking about this, that in 1808, uh, the, the Madison's uh, um, Mason, Hugh Chisholm, he had to rebuild the first 18 courses of brick up to the water line, which is right here. And so you can actually see this rebuild. You can see where these black and purple bricks are. These are all huge isms bricks all through this area. 
and where these um, where these where these uh, um, uh, uh, peers were for the supporting the Vortico deck, he couldn't get behind there. So the the brickwork in here is really poor, but on, on these areas, the brick brickwork work is much better. So you could actually see the shadows of where those peers were. And what this did is it gave us an idea that you know in the in the Madison period, this grade was much higher. And this began to help us understand, you know, what had happened with the evolution of the landscape. And this also made us realize that putting bathrooms under the portico was a really bad idea because we were going to have to have entrance ramps that went under the portico for quite a bit of distance to make them, you know, ADA acceptable. And then there's also the impact this was going to have on the house. So the idea of putting bathrooms under the portico went away. I'm, I don't know if you can see it. I'm giving a thumbs up to that. It was, we were very happy when that idea went the way of the dodo bird. And uh, um, and we have the bathrooms in the dog kennel today, which works out a lot better. That's those are the bathrooms that you all might have seen in your more recent visits. So this is what the, um, the uh, you know, the, the appearance of the grade around 1812. And let me get rid of um, my annotation here clear all the drawings, there we go. And so when you get into, let's see, when you get to 1848, this is when some pretty drastic changes start to happen to the grade around the house. So you go from uh, 1812 and you've got the, 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 the grade that went all the way up to um, the, the edge of the house and, the, and the, the, uh, the columns went deeper, fortunately, because they're supporting quite a bit of weight. I mean, these columns are, they're unreinforced masonry. So they're just, basically gravity is holding them in place. And then in 1848, what the next owners decided to do is they turned Montpelier basically into a Greek revival house. And this is when the house is stuccoed, they bring the grade that's around the house lower and they lower the grade under the portico to provide this passageway underneath the portico. And so this was a way for the, um, the slaves to get from one side of the house to the other. But this is after the Madison period. This is, you know, so post-Madison, this is nothing we, we, we were, you know, wanted to restore. Um, and what we found in our excavations is that when they cut the grade below the portico, and you can see this really dramatically over here, this line, this is the last set of bricks for the column. So they actually dug the grade lower than the bottom brick of the columns for the portico, which is absolutely terrifying. Because you think of this soil going through the frost heave cycle of about even 20 years, basically this would start to crumble away and the bricks would start to fall in. And so you'd have the, you know, your, your, the, the columns that support the portico and the parts of the house be severely compromised. Well, they realized this was a really bad idea as well. So what they did is they decided, and I'll skip forward to this to show you this, is when um, uh, later on they filled this area in to raise the grade around the portico. But how we discovered this is through the excavation. So if we go back to this shot right here, this is still in 1848. Um, what you can see is, is uh, you've got the, uh, the 20, 2004 grade that runs along here. This is where you've got the paint line, the, you know, the paint that's ab above the, the, what was then the modern grade. Once we took the bricks out and all the fill, what we found was the intact remains of the original rendering of the house that was done in 1848. And there were Civil War soldiers accounts talking about the house, this is in 1863, of the house being built of granite which doesn't make any sense until you see how they've rendered the stucco with white mortar lines. And actually this was whitewashed with a gray wash and then brick black flex to make it look like limestone. And it was pretty convincing. And what was amazing about this paint was, is about two weeks after we finished these excavations, all this paint disappeared. I mean, it was, it was just, it was like, you know, when you hear about these tombs being opened up and then just things disappearing. This, the evidence for this paint just went away. 
And of course, we're going to be taking it away as well with the you know, repairs we needed to do in the house, but we got all that reported. <clears throat> so what we knew from this stucco along with the stucco lip is this is how we knew this original grade was a little bit lower. And then um, in 1849, what they decide to do is they, they bring the grade outside the portico lower down because originally in 1848, there was a temporary deck put in place and then a stairway. But in around 1849, they removed the grade in front of the house. And this is in anticipation of, you know, bringing the driveway all the way up to the front of the house, much as it was in the 20th century. And when they, um, what they do is they lengthen the columns all the way down to this new grade. So what they do is they trim off all this brick to go from the plinths as they were in the Madison era, trim this off. And what happens with all this brick material is it gets deposited around the base of these columns and is basically left in place. So where they, they have the slaves trimming down this masonry work, they just leave this debris. And we found it in 2004 all around these columns. And what we found was just some really amazing evidence for the Madison era appearance of the columns. We found these torus bricks, which are part of the base of the, uh, of the, of the original Madison bricks. And we also found was whitewash that showed that the columns of the bricks weren't painted, but were white. And then the trim on the house is kind of this buff color. So you have this, this contrasting whitewash with the buff trim that the architects found for the rest of the woodwork. So that's what creates this, you know, this striking appearance of the house and, and follows some you know, period recommendations for how to you know, sequence your, your columns with the other paint schemes. So what we've got with, it, with this rendering is all this architectural material that was torn off the columns, that's covered over, and that, there's the whitewashed columns of today. That then is covered over with a clay fill. And this clay fill, we're thinking, is coming from when they, when they um, uh, before they trim the columns, they lower the grade in front of the house, but they're also lowering, the slaves are lowering the grade all in front of the house. They, took it, they take some of that leftover clay and infill under the portico to raise the grade so that it's at the level of the bottom brick of the, the, the portico columns. And basically, this is to protect those bricks that have been exposed to you know, all that weathering. After they put down this base of clay, that's when they put in the, um, the, uh, the, new, the new deck. This was in 1849, and then put in the, um, the, uh, the sand bed and then the brick paving. And so after, and you can see this whole sequence right here with the, the, all the clay fill, the sand, and then the brick paving right here. And this is much as it, as it remained up until we started taking it apart in 2003. So with, with this, what we, what, we, what we had, what we found under the portico was this brick pavement and later on, we did excavations around to the north and the south of the portico. What we found is this brick pavement that was put down in the 1840s extends all the way around the house. So these area ways, you know, for, for the slaves for walking from this, you know, in this, in this case, the north kitchen, north cellar kitchen to the south cellar kitchen near the south yard would have been uh, done under the portico, but they would have been, you know, probably ducking their heads and probably most times walking around the portico because that would be a, a hell of a place to try to you know carry any kind of supplies but um and there's actually there are actually um period houses dating to the 1830s and 40s that have these kind of area ways uh in virginia this is kind of a, a neoclassical to greek revival uh um uh, setup for um for community having the, um, the enslaved servants and slaves working in, the, uh, in the, some of these cellar spaces. So 1849, you get this brick pavement that goes down. And at the same time this brick pavement is going down, this is, this is the time period when you have larger changes to uh, Montpelier. This is when, you know, in 1848, with the purchase of Montpelier by the Thornton family, this is when the south yard is all taken down. And then the front fence is taken up and the new road is brought all the way to the front of the house. And with that, all the fill from lowering, lowering the grade in front of the house, all that is taken and used to not only fill underneath the portico to raise the grade to the bottom level of the bricks, 
but also this clay was used to cover over the old Madison Road in front of the house. And so then what you result in is, you know, this road goes away and you've got the, you know, the landscape of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, late, late 19th, early 20th century. So when we started doing excavate, we, we finished the excavations under the, um, under the uh, portico by, uh, that was the, the um, winter of 2004. When we started doing excavations in the front yard, this is when we realized, you know, the fills we're finding out here were from in front of the house. And we realized, you know, what a massive landscaping campaign happened in the 1848 to 1849 period. You know, not just the buildings were taken down, but you know, the whole layout of the front of the house and the appearance of the house going from a neoclassical structure to this Greek, Greek revival structure happens. And this is where, you know, really without the excavations under the portico, it would have been a lot more difficult to figure out what we found in the front yard and to really restore, you know, the, ma the, the, the mansion to back to where it is today. And so with this final shot, you can see that, you know, with the restoration, we, we graded the area up to the bottom of these windows. And it doesn't look like that much until you go back to this earlier shot. Let's see, um, this one, yeah, right here. You can see how much fill we needed to put in under the portico. So it was a, a pretty dramatic change. That's about, um, let's, let's see, that is one, two, three, uh, four feet. That's about four and a half feet of fill that went under the portico. So some pretty, pretty drastic changes. So this is the, um, the what we, why we excavated under the portico and what we found. And uh, love to open this up for, um, for, for questions. Oh, I, I see, I love Chris's comment, your sweet baby well house looking so fresh. That is really, the, I think it's this shot. Which shot was that? It was, yeah, I guess this one right here, you can barely see the well house put, um, uh, peeking out. So, oh, Sharita's is asking, where do we get the fill? <clears throat> we get the fill, um, oh, you know what was going on, Sharita? You'll remember this. When we were doing the work on the front of the house, that's when the new bridge was going in. You all might remember that the old bridge used to come in beside the post office. And then 2004 is when we put the new bridge in. We had to get a whole borrow site. We, we dug out behind the uh, schooling barn for the clay fill for the bridge. And we used part of that fill for reestablishing the grade around the main house. And then, Prinny, why did the Madisons not have the drive come right to the door? That was actually a question that we had, Prinny, because the, you know, the, uh, the driveway that was put in in 1848 coming to the front makes a lot more sense. Well, when we started doing investigations of where this gate was, Alan Brown, who's a landscape historian and a landscape architect, he did some, some studies for us. And there's actually a, a landscape volume written by this landscape, our landscape um, gardener uh, by the name of Switzer in the l early 18th century. And he talks about your approach to the house being you know, your first real view and where, where you begin to take in your approach to the stairs should be the distance of the width of the house. So in this case, uh, which 88 feet, from the front steps of the house. And when we took the, the width of the house, which means the length of the house, and extended out from the front steps, that's exactly where we found the dooryard gate, to a foot, which was absolutely amazing. So there's actually, you know, these landscape accounts that write about how to do these layouts. And this is, these are these garden books of the, you know, the 18th century that go into all these details. Yeah, there's many, as many garden, there's many books about how to do your landscaping in a neoclassical way as there is books about architecture because these landscapes are considered, you know, seamless with the building itself. Is anyone else, and if anybody wants to call out their questions, you don't have to type them, so. Let me see if I missed any questions here. Um, Oh yeah, Mary answered Patrick's question about renaming. Yeah, thanks, Mary. 
Well, how many of you all actually saw the, the main house when it used to be configured like it is in this picture right here? I know Sharita did. Let me look. Uh, I'm not sure if Zeb did. Yeah, Sharita recalls it. Patrick gives a thumb up. So it looks like you're around here, Patrick. And uh, yeah, Chris, uh, Christine, Brittany, of course you did. So. <laughs> So um, well, does anybody have any, any questions about you know, the portico, the excavations we did? Did you find um, artifacts? You found a lot of building information, but did you find objects or bits of objects? We, we actually did, Prinny. We, um, one, uh, the, with the fill that was brought in to, um, to fill the grade under the portico, there was quite a bit of topsoil that was dug out around the house. So we were finding, you know, artifacts that dated from the 1760s through the 1850s, all mixed into that layer of clay fill. And if I go back to, let's see, yeah, this layer right here. So what's labeled um, C and D in the shot right here, there's all kinds of artifacts from trash deposits that have been dug up and then redeposited under the portico. And one of the cool things we found in this area where my arrow is, right up in here, is we found a, um, a schnapps bottle from the 1840s and this uh, green glazed um, uh, tobacco pipe. It was a stub stem tobacco pipe. And the, <clears throat> the, the, um, the um, Carson brothers were from Ireland. And the, some of this pavement had to be, was disturbed um, in the Carson era to rebuild the stairs. So this green uh, stub stem pipe is from the, Ir the most Irish period of Montpelier when the Carson brothers owned it. And they, one of, the, one of their, their housekeepers was from Ireland. So of course, when we found that, you know, being under excavations going under the portico, there's all kinds of stories that we were making up as archeologists about that, how those got there. So the snops model and the tobacco pipe. But uh, most of the artifacts we found were of course architectural, but there is a, you know, a few redepositive items that we did find. I, th I think, uh, Matt, it's really interesting to see with these different um, strata, you know how they got there you know in this this picture that's up now for example um stratum c mm -hmm. uh, you know and you it, to me this is re it's really interesting to see what these strata represent and, and have an idea as you have been explaining how they got there um I just wanted to, and, and then and then um, I was wondering, you know, as this G, the GIS uh, program moves along, I guess we'll be able to actually see, say, for example, stratum C across its entire uh, scope, or or follow stratum C as far as it goes. Yeah, exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, that is that's right, Dean. Is um and actually I could bring up um the um the IMLS map that we've got. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm bringing this up right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you all see this map right here, this this is actually the map of all the digitized. Um, excavation surfaces that Hannah and Taylor have been working on. And when you click on any of these, what you can see is, um, let's see, this is, let's try it on. Yeah, so this one is stratum B right here. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the photo that's here. And then when you click on the strat card, it actually brings up the stratum card. So what we're what we've done is we've taken every single you know excavation layer in every, in every unit, and all that has been digitized. And then we've tied all the records that you all have been relabeling 
to each of the, um, the stratum cards. And what's also in, in this sequence is these um, uh, wall profiles. So let me see if I can skip to, yeah, this is the, the uh, wall profile right here. So this wall profile, this is an actual drawing of the wall. Here's a photo of it right here. And then when you click over, you can actually see the drawn profile of this. And so each of these profiles right here that are in green, we've got the records attached to this. So one of the things that we also want to do is once we get um, uh, some of these areas digitized, we're going to be creating basically 3D rooms of these spaces where you can see the profiles, how they connect to each other, um, you know, on all four sides. And I, um, I think I can, let me try to bring this up because it's kind of cool. Let me see. Um, I'm going to bring up the, uh, there's a, an initial stab that, um, that Angie did for us on, oh, here it is, web scene, main house. I think this is the web scene right here. This is University of uh, Arkansas. Yeah, this is University of Arkansas. And so, um, let hmm. me see if me, um, I'm not used to doing the scenes here, turn off the building. And I think I need to turn the base map. No, I don't have it in this one. Shoot, there, this is the 3D imagery of the house. Mm -hmm. And we've got a set of units that we have in a 3D format. She might have taken this, um, this, this, uh, um, that layer off the, uh, the server right now, because we're all, we're, mm -hmm. we're just working on this. Or I am on the wrong side of the house. No, I was, I was on the front of the house. So the, obviously this model is not complete. We're still doing, doing work on this. But um, yeah, I'll stop sharing here. So let me see, um, Richard asks, Matt, I'm curious, the brick pattern we are seeing under the portico, is that same pattern later discovered in the basement? Yeah, it's that herringbone pattern the same herringbone pattern we found under the portico is what was in uh, what we call Dolly's kitchen or the North kitchen. And so we're thinking that um, that that brick was there up until the DuPont years. The DuPont workers took that that herringbone pattern brick up in 1901. And that pattern of brick that might have inspired, you know, who was, whoever was doing the work to put the herringbone pattern underneath the portico. And then Lynn asked, Matt, how do you analyze soil exactly for age? What, how we do that is, um, let me share screens again. Um, share uh, and get to this slide. One of the best slides for this actually is right Oh, it's the one that shows the stucco. Let me find that one. Oh, it's down here. Okay. It, this one right here. So um, when you look at this picture right here, let's see. Five. This shot right here, what you've got is um, uh, you have all these layers that are, are here. You, you can't necessarily date, you can sometimes date the layers from the artifacts. But if I skip this one all the way to the beginning of the, of the slideshow, if you look at this um, shot right here, the Artifacts that are in layers C and D, remember those are from all that fill that was dug up around the front of the portico and redeposited underneath. So you've got artifacts that date from, you know, the, um, 
the, uh, the, the 1760s all the way into the 1840s. One way you can date this layer is, is there are no artifacts in this fill that post-dated 1848. You know, didn't, not, no Civil War artifacts whatsoever found in this fill right here. So we knew the fill was put down before the Civil War. But then how we were able to date it in relationship to, the, um, to 1847 is that was established with this stucco lip. That soil went all the way over here and filled against this line right here. So that, that layer of clay and the sand and brick, all the paint we had right here ended at this level. And by knowing when this paint went on, this paint sequence, we knew that this paint, the earliest, um, the earliest the, the house was repainted after it was stuccoed was in the 1880s. And so initially, and so that with a paint line ending right at the brick, we knew that it couldn't, you know, that, that if, this, if this was exposed before 1880, all that would have been painted. So the, the, that, that paint line allowed, allowed us to establish that the, this fill went in before the 1880s. But then when we sort of look in the docu at the documentary record, that's where we found the reference that the Thornton family was the one that made all the changes to the portico. And that's how we were able to establish that they're the ones that had, you know, the, the columns trimmed down and the grade pulled down below the portico. So it was actually, you know, through two or three of, you know, lining up stratigraphy with historical records, with architectural evidence, that we were able to date, you know, this sequence and all the stratigraphy that was, was there. Um, let me see. And I think I got everybody's uh, questions. Let me stop, um, stop sharing again here. But um, anybody have any other questions or comments? Cool. Well, what I'll do is I will, um, I, I'm pretty sure that Zoom has recorded everybody that's here. I got a screenshot so I can remember who, who you all are. I will, um, I'll send you all a copy of the Portico report. And actually, if you all, I'll, I'll do something even better. If I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and share screens again. This is what we've been having fun with GIS, is we have basically a, a full archive of everything in GIS. So let me go to, um, I'm a less current map. I'll share this map with you, this one. And with this map, what you'll notice is you've got these little white dotted lines right here. When you click on those, the, the, this white dot, these white dotted lines are the outline for the projects that we did. And so when you click on these, what comes up is the, the cover for the report. And when you click on the report, what you actually get is the, the Google Doc of the Portico report. So with this map, what you've got at your fingertips is, for example, where we're moving to next is the bunker. If you click on the white outline here, Here's the, uh, the portico or, or the rear, rear lawn report. And you click on that and this brings up the PDF for the back lawn. So let me, I'll go ahead and put this link into the chat box. And then you all can copy this and bring this up on your own computer. So that went to, um, that's in the, the Zoom group chat. And if you copy that URL, and I'll send this to you all as well. We've written a note. Um, send URL for reports to Zoom. But I'll send you all this, and you'll you'll basically have have our, our archive at your fingertips. Um, when DJ was here, he he put all these, you know, uh, made these project areas and associated all the reports with them. But there's just you know all kinds of information that's in there and there's a picture of a trowel. I have no idea why. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's appropriate to have a picture of a trowel when it comes to an archeology span report. So, but uh, so if you all, your, your homework is to read all these reports. So these, um, 
uh, reports are each probably about 200 pages. So, um, and if you look at how many reports we've got out here, you're gonna have probably about five years of reading at your, at your fingertips. So this will take you through COVID and beyond. <laughs> so, um, and there's, you know, all kinds of sites you can explore here, Dolly's Midden. Um, and uh, what I, uh, um, if y'all have any questions about how to use that web map, let me know. Um, you're, you're, the web map that you have that's made publicly is a little bit simpler than this. Let me show you what this actually looks like. I'll bring up a, um, an Internet Explorer screen that I don't have any login data for. This is what the web map comes up, it'll, how it'll come up on your screen. And what you'll do is if you want to turn layers on and off, you've got, this has basically the legend right here. If you click on content, then what you can do is you can turn layers on and off. So you can turn off all the layers until you're down to absolutely nothing. Even the hill shade, the, the LIDAR is gone. Or you can just turn on the unit or the uh, project area where we excavated units. And this is kind of a simpler way to be able to see this. So if, if you're not logged into GIS, you can't break anything on this. So just go to town on it. But if you happen to be an Esri user, please be careful because you can actually delete things on this. So, because we have this open for, uh, for you know, Hannah and Taylor and myself to, and other, other staff members to work on. But how many of you all are registered Esri um, users and have a, have a license? Yeah, Hannah does, so I don't see too many other hands. So don't feel like you'll break our maps. And if you know enough to have an Esri license, you wouldn't break our maps. We'd just bring you on and have you do even more work. So if you actually do, let us know and we'll put you even, give you, have even more work for you to do. So, well, cool. Well, great seeing everybody. Um, Richard, we are doing backups all about, about once a week. We need to do it. I need to make sure we have that scheduled down. And, um, Hannah and Taylor remind me of that because we don't want to lose your work. So, <laughs> yep, Hannah gave a thumbs up on that one. Thank you, Richard. Always looking out for us. All right, everybody. Well, great seeing you all. And uh, um, I'll send you the, uh, the link to this and uh, uh, hope you all have a good rest of the day. We'll see you next week. Mary is talking about wine and archaeology. So go ahead and, uh, and we can, we'll tune in then. So, all right. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll send the recording out as well in case uh, anybody had to leave early. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, I just uh, uh, tried opening that map in, like, not signed into my account. And I was able to, like, uh, enter and, like, click on, like, a unit and add information to it, not signed in. Oh, okay. That's. And, uh, like, add, like, I can, like, draw a unit and stuff, are we... but not signed in at all. I wonder if there's a way to limit the access to that because that isn't good because somebody could accidentally there there is um i i can uh i could go look at that layer okay yeah if you could look at that layer and limit that that'd be great thank you chris yeah yep i can do cool. that uh, thanks for checking cool. on that so that was good matt all right thanks yeah all right all right, all right bye i'm gonna go ahead and end now i'm gonna make sure we get the record.